My title is, What Makes the Temple So Special? What makes the temple so special? Why would we be interested in the temple of God? For me, over the years when I've studied the, the Bible, the idea of the temple became rather confusing. I wasn't sure which temple was which. The, the Bible seems to talk about the temple in various places. And I thought, I don't understand. And I just kind of put it on my back burner of my mind, and I didn't really think about it much. So. I wanted to come to a better understanding of what it is as well as where it is referred to. So I did a little study on that and later learned that the temple actually has different phases. Hmm, that was something I needed to know. And it, when it started out, it didn't start out as a temple. It started out as a tabernacle. And so we want to look at, at there's four different ramifications of this, of this thing we call either the tabernacle or the temple. Now, I didn't realize there's four. Actually, there's a fifth one, but we won't go to there. We're going to look at these four different iterations, if you will, of this temple. The first one is found in Exodus 25. Exodus chapter 25 is the first mention of this tabernacle. Let's go to Exodus 25, shall we? And look at this. We know that in Exodus 20 was the giving of the law, Mount Sinai. And chapter 24 follows quite soon thereafter. And God had given them a book of the covenant to read on the hearing. And the people said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. That was the, the agreement. That's in chapter, 20, or chapter 24 and verse 7. But where I want to go is chapter 25, and this is the offerings of the sanctuary. And so here is a very key phrase that is important to understanding what makes the temple so special, to answer our question. The phrase is in verse 8. It says, let me, no, let them, let, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. That phrase, he wanted to dwell with his people, is so vital to this whole subject. God wants to dwell with us. We want to dwell with him, ultimately. Our goal is to dwell with God. But what holds us back from dwelling with him? What keeps us separated? Uh, we know that <laughs> we learn <laughs> when we learn about sin, we learn about our iniquities, we find out what it is that's separating us from God. And he had to establish a place where offerings could be made. A priesthood could be established. What was the reason for that? To make a place where offerings could be made and reconciliation for sin would be made available. To, re to resolve the problem of the division that was between the people and God. So that was the purpose of this tabernacle. You can read through the whole, these chapters here, chapters 25 through 40, do a study of those. You find all the different descriptions of this tabernacle. It was a mobile one. It could be transported from one place to another. They'd put it, take it down, move it, reassemble it at another place, and so forth. So... But it had different characteristics involved with it. It has an altar, a veil, a high priest, a holy of holies. There was a design to it. There were specifications they were to follow. And it had symbols involved with it. The second one that I want to note of the, of the temples is a real temple this time. It's not just a tabernacle. It's a building that was built on the ground that was permanent, stayed in one place. <laughs> You find of it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
It said the, the version of the temple was an idea of David. David had this idea of building this temple. And he couldn't do it. God didn't want him to for reasons of David's own history and things. God didn't want him to do it. And I had 2 Samuel. It's actually 1 Samuel. Sorry about that. 1 Samuel 7. But in 1 Kings, when you go to 1 Kings, sorry, 2 Samuel 7, that's right. Sorry about that again. Now we're going to 1 Kings 5. In 1 Kings 5, we see the job of the construction was started out. The specifications were laid out, very intricate specifications, distances, how many cubits this way and how many <laughs> cubits that way. And I have, I brought this old atlas of the Bible from Reader's Digest, published many years ago. It has an illustration here, if you can see it, of this temple, temple of, of Solomon that was made. And it follows the same kind of pattern that God had specified all along. It has certain characteristics about it that he had kept. The Holy of Holies, the place for the cherubim, the walls with the decorations on them, the pillars, the, the, even the, the angle of it. If you'll notice that this, this drawing or this illustration, it's looking at the temple from the north, okay? It's, a, it's, the north, it's from the north looking to the south, and it's a cutaway of the northern side of the tabernacle, I mean the temple. But the, this way over here to your right is the, the western way. That's the looking west. That way is looking east. It always had to be in the same angle, the same place, the same positioning on the earth. And it's interesting that God noted that in his designs. In 1 Kings 8, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 15 to 21, we won't read that, but Solomon gave the dedication for this temple. And in so doing, once it was finished, the purpose of it was still the same, to offer a way for the people to make reconciliation with God. And in verse 57 to 60 in that chapter, 1 Kings 8, you see there was always this expectation of God's great purpose, of he wanted to be able to dwell with the people. He wanted the people to be able to dwell with him. There's a connective tissue he wants to establish, if you will, with us, with human beings. And that was the way to do it. So... In 2 Kings 24, we know that the story of Judah, you know, <laughs> Judah went bad after the kings of Judah, and eventually that that temple was destroyed, the one that was in this drawing, artwork, that was destroyed, and the pieces and parts and gold and the goblets and everything about it were carted off to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar came and took it all away. All oh, that gorgeous gold and all the gorgeous, everything about it was because God had left it. They, the, the Judah left God, so God left it and the way it went. Well, then the third iteration of the temple comes along in Ezra. In Ezra 1, and 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, you, we read about King Cyrus, king of Persia. And Cyrus was moved by God to go down and establish a temple in Jerusalem again. In verse 2 it says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth, of, of the, earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So the beginning of the uh, temple was orchestrated and administered by Cyrus, and then Darius came along later, and this thing was again specified. There were specifications for this temple, specifications of its size, 
you can read of those things. In Ezra chapter 6, Ezra chapter 5 is where the work began. Ezra chapter 6, it gives the specifications for the construction of it. It's all very specific. And even in that, I think even in the specifications is a lesson that God is teaching all of us. There are rules, there are lines to follow. It's got to face in a certain direction. It's a certain amount of feet, so many feet high, this and that. All the specifications have to do with our willingness to obey God and do it his way. <laughs> Each one has a lesson in itself. And that's so amazing to me. Now this, let, this temple lasted until the time of Jesus Christ in the first century. Today I'm not going into times and dates. I don't have time for that. It's not the purpose of this message. I'm only highlighting these four different iterations of the temple. This was the third one, where it was at that time, before when the Roman Empire began, Rome came along. By the time Jesus is a human being, he then came to the temple. You remember when he came to the temple and they were selling goods and stuff, the money changers were at the temple and they were doing their thing, and <laughs> he cast them out. They had made the, the temple of God a temple of, or a place of wolves, a place of, of just wrong, of sin, you know. And so he talked about what is holy. He, made the, he talked, to, Jesus talked about the gold. Does the gold make the temple holy or does the temple make the gold holy? And first you have to have the temple in order to establish the value that's in the gold that kind of thing. So that was the third iteration of it. The fourth iteration of it is now the most exciting part because now comes this other temple. And if you'll please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians 6, we're cutting this big story short here for this message. But in chapter, 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 16, we read this. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What did he say to the children of Israel that we saw in Exodus 25 and verse 8. He came to dwell with his people, to sanctify them. He still got the same message. It's still the same principle. God wants to have a dwelling place with us. We want, don't we, that's our job, our goal is to have a dwelling place with him. We want to dwell with God. He's our father. Through Jesus Christ, we can have this dwelling take place, this oneness, this bond of friendship, of love, of family. God's whole purpose was family all along. From the time when they first designed and came the idea, let's make human beings. First we had to make an earth so we could have dirt. Then we took the dirt and made human beings out of the dirt. Gave them life, gave them breath, gave them a, you know, a place to live. We gave them laws. We gave them everything they would need so that they would have a relationship with us, if I may paraphrase God's words. But what happened? Oh, what happened? We sinned. Man sinned <laughs> and cut the whole thing in two. And what is he establishing? He's called you and me and given us his Holy Spirit. We repent before God, Acts chapter 2. We receive the gift of his Holy Spirit. We have a relationship through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one who gave his life and that temple at his time, you remember how the, the drapery, the, the veil was, was ripped in two. And now the access to the Holy of Holies was made available through Jesus. It hadn't been available to man before. So, in Ephesians 2, you read of growing together to become a holy temple. And in 1 Corinthians 3, and verse 16, it says, you are the temple of God. 
How awesome is this? We are the temple of God. I'm looking at you. You are the temple of God now. You're not that tabernacle that was in the wilderness that was made of, of wool and whatever, the material. You're not the one built in stone. You're not the one that was built by Solomon. You are the temple of God now. I'm the temple, part of the temple. God's spirit is dwelling in us. That makes us a temple of God. How exciting is that? <laughs> and what was this? What was his main function, brother? And what was the whole point that he wanted a temple? He wanted a temple in which to dwell. He wanted some place in which to dwell together with us. And that's what makes the temple so special, because it's you and me, among other things. 